Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmad, and thank you uh, for your center and program for this invitation. Thank you also, Dr. Muhammad Ahmad and all those involved in this uh, event. Uh, my description that I distributed, I realize it's probably a lot for a short talk. So I might only cover the first half, which is the, uh, and I re-entitled it, Colonization by Imagination, Early Photography and Palestine. Let me start before talking about photography by reminding you, you probably know, that Palestine is a country with a long, long history, with uh, cities that have been around for millennia, including uh, probably the oldest is Jericho, but uh, Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem, Nazareth, and many, many other cities. And when we talk about Palestine, we often think of its religious significance, particularly when it comes to particular cities that are either relevant to Islam, Christianity, Judaism, most of the time relevant to the three together. But we forget that a city, any city, in order for it to be a city, it's not just that it is a location of something significant for someone's historical or religious imagination. To be a city means to have a society, to have a culture, to have an economy, to have people living in. So it is a socially inhabited space. And often that is missing in the picture. And mentioning picture, this is exactly what I am going to try to uh, highlight today. As you know, Palestine, uh, part of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, uh, with the inception of photography or the announcement for the invention of photography in 1839, photographers from Europe flooded uh, uh, the world basically to document faraway places, unfamiliar places or significant places. And Palestine and Egypt were the first two locations in, uh, in photography, in the history of photography in the Middle East or what we call today the Middle East that were photographed. Only months after the announcement of photography, French and British or English photographers uh, arrived in the region documenting significant places. And of course, gradually, uh, photography would spread uh, to the rest of the Ottoman world and it will become a native career where natives in various areas will, will take up this new trade and career. So it, it will evolve eventually and there will be uh, uh, different themes. However, the early photographers, 19th century photography, generally speaking, with some exceptions, of course, especially towards the end of the 19th century, was done by European photographers. And I use here European in its cultural sense meaning Americans uh, will be included, Australians will be included in, 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 in that sense. So the uh, bulk of the photography of the 19th century of Palestine was conducted by uh, Europeans in general. Uh, and of course, when it came to Palestine, Europeans arrived to Palestine and documented particular locations. Uh, so basically, most of the photographers who arrived, or all of the photographers, uh, for example, when they arrived in Egypt, they uh, photographed not the Egyptian society, but the pyramids and some uh, ancient Egyptian uh, locations. And when they came to Palestine, they documented places familiar to the European imagination, to the European customers. And those were usually uh, a handful of cities that were connected with stories from the Bible, be it the Christian or the Jewish Bible in that sense. Uh, so therefore, the intention of the photographers was not to document the country and its people, but rather to document what is important to the European imagination. And in this sense, we noticed that a focus, the largest focus was on the city of Jerusalem, but also the city of Bethlehem, city of Nazareth, 
uh, Hebron, some other cities that are relevant to one or, uh, or another of the uh, uh, religious, uh, th uh, three, three religions of Palestine at the time. Uh, the interesting thing is probably one of the most photographed places in Jerusalem was always the Dome of the Rock, which appears here. This is actually not the 19th century, but the 1920s National Geographic photographer. And the Dome of the Rock is the oldest still existing mosque in the history of uh, of the world. Even Al Kaaba in Mecca was rebuilt. But this was built in the Umayyad period, finished around 690 AD or CE, whatever you like, uh, and it has continuously been in use, mostly as a mosque for a brief period under the Crusades. It was transformed, but later on reclaimed as a mosque. And uh, this is a uh, architectural wonder, basically from its own time. Yet it appears often in the early photography with the caption of the site of Solomon's Temple, as you see here, site of Solomon's Temple from the Northwest. It is an amazing ability for a photographer to see in front of them something that presumably existed roughly 3,000 years before, or maybe 2,500 years before, and fail to see what is in front of their eyes. This is the cultural blindness of, of Orientalism, as we know, for uh, it is simply described as a site rather than as a building, as a mosque, or whatever you like. Obsession with the Dome of the Rock continues. We find it here, for example, by the French photographer Bonfils from the 1870s. It is described as the Mosque of Omar. And the Mosque of Omar is not the Dome of the Rock. The Mosque of Omar is a familiar place, or there is a story familiar to the European imagination, uh, which talks about the Muslim conquest of Jerusalem, the arrival of Omar ibn al-Khattab, at least that's the narrative. I have no proofs of any of these things. And it's roughly 635, maybe something like this, 636. And when the patriarch, Christian patriarch of Jerusalem, invited him to pray in the church of the Holy Sepulchre, the story goes that Omar, the Caliph Omar, uh, declined and said, if I pray here, uh, Muslims will take over the place and it will become a mosque. So he went outside and prayed. And true enough, a mosque was erected there named the Mosque of Omar. So that story is familiar, but the mosque itself is not picturesque. So therefore, if you want that story to stand out, you need to have the Dome of the Rock, which is splendid architecturally. So it will be called often the, uh, do, the Mosque of Omar, despite its uh, uh, mis uh, you know, misnomer. Uh, you, we continue to see the Dome of the Rock. This is a uh, photograph by Maxime Ducamp or Duchamp, a French photographer who traveled with his colleague uh, Gustave Flaubert to Egypt and Palestine in 1849. And he took uh, images of early images of uh, Palestine and of Egypt. And we notice in this picture and the previous ones that there is always emptiness. You see the place, if I go back and if you see this one, you don't see any people there. Of course, early photography was rather sensitive for movement. Sometimes you needed to uh, freeze everything in order to capture, but that was quickly overcome. For example, in this case, this is 1870s, that was resolved. The shutter of the screen, uh, of the lens, did not need as long as in the past, and it was always possible to have people in the images. If you think about a mosque, in Jerusalem, also often by Muslims outside of Palestine, confused with Al-Aqsa Mosque, because it's in the compound of Al-Aqsa Mosque, but this is not Al-Aqsa Mosque, this is the Dome of the Rock. Either way, it's a Muslims, if you know, pray five times a day. Mosques, especially in that early time, were places of meeting. 
classes took place there. Uh, people went on picnics around these mosques. These were like, like the only public squares, so to speak. Uh, so to, ha to imagine a mosque like this, empty, with no one around, it must have taken some effort for the photographer to make sure that no one is going to appear within the frame. And that is rather significant. And I go back to Maxime de Camp. Maxime de Camp took 11 photographs of Palestine. Of course, uh, photography was rather complicated. There was no iPhone, no digital, no celluloid films. Photographers had to carry uh, heavy glass negatives. It was a process to take each picture. So it was not easy to take a lot of pictures. Each picture required a lot of work that photographers were meticulous in their choice, what is inside the frame and what's not. And the camp as pictures of Palestine, none of them had any people in them. In contrast, his images in Egypt, around the same time as you see, he always insisted on having one person appear, uh, basically as a measuring yard or as a measuring stick. To give you an idea how large, huge the Abu Sumbul uh, over here by with contrast with the person. And he writes in his notes about how he hired people to appear in the pictures, describing them as greedy, you know, etc., etc. The camp felt that he needed to show that in Egypt, to hire someone to appear uh, in his photographs. It was the same guy who appeared in all of his photographs. But he did not feel the need in the case of Palestine to probably, what well, must have been sacrilegious to have a local Arab or, uh, or any, anything else, you know, the city is mixed in place that is rather holy somehow. So there are no pictures of people that in, in most of early 19th century photography in general. However, there are exceptions. And those exceptions I call uh, people's types. And the exceptions, for example, here we have a carpenter in Nazareth. Why would anyone go to Palestine and find a carpenter? Uh, which is, okay, carpenters are necessary, but Palestine was famous, for example, with olive, olives, uh, famous with uh, other, uh, other productions. Uh, kind of holy land, paraphernalia, olive wood statues, etc. Icon paintings. But no, he insisted on a carpenter from Nazareth. Why? Because in the Bible, the Christian Bible, now we're talking about the New Testament, Jesus is uh, uh, father, I suppose, or, you know, uh, whatever, formally his father, according to the Christian tradition, was Joseph the carpenter. So we go to Nazareth, we find uh, a carpenter, or we take images of women in Nazareth, which brings to mind the Virgin Mary uh, in Christianity. Again, oh, here we are. Or we go look, we find images. These are, uh, you see two images, this is called stereoscopes. And stereoscopes were uh, popular in the late uh, end of the 19th century, early 20th century. You had to see them in a viewer and they become 3D, three dimensions. And on the back, you always have a uh, description. Most of the time, it's a description uh, directly from the Bible, either the uh, Old Testament or the New Testament. So here we have shepherds uh, in the plain of Jerzeel. Of course, this is the use of biblical language. Name, naming of the place changed dramatically at different times. And uh, therefore, we, uh, how do we go back here? Uh, it brings to mind also the story of the birth of Jesus, where an angel appeared, according to the New Testament, to the shepherds, informing them that the Lord will be born today or something along these lines. Uh, we also find images uh, of course, remember, we don't know who these people are. They're not identified. It's not like Abu Muhammad, etc., etc. But what we have is field of wheat. And we, these are, I'm giving you examples of pictures that were very popular. Practically every photographer 
that went to Palestine took the same images, more or less, and I will come to this later on. And uh, the, uh, it brings to mind a biblical story, the, and the caption is usually called the field of Boaz, a character from the Old Testament, I believe. I don't know, recall now the, the whole story. But of course, I'm looking at these people, my guess it would be either they are Ibrahim, uh, Muhammad, maybe George, maybe uh, Abdul Karim, who knows, maybe Fatma. But, no, but the last thing that will come to mind is Boaz a name that is Hebrew name, only at the time available in the Bible, not in Palestine. The Jews of Palestine used regular Arabic names uh, or Arab, uh, Jewish names with an Arabic intonation or with an Arab. So again, it is uh, everything in the Bible is, is the reference, the same with uh, 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 fishermen in the Sea of Galilee. The disciples of Jesus were all fishermen from the Sea of Galilee, as you know. However, there are exceptions for the emptiness or the particular representation of certain groups, and we find them on occasion with feasts. Here, is, uh, uh, here are two images of the Holy Sepulchre. The Holy Sepulchre, if you don't know, is the main church in Jerusalem that includes inside it the uh, crucifixion site. Now, I haven't done any archaeological work. I cannot confirm, but this, this is the tradition. From the fourth century, the Byzantines built a church there uh, on the site of the crucifixion and the tomb of Jesus. So it is perhaps the most important, significant church for Christendom historically. Uh, here we have uh, people on Easter, of course it's an important location for Easter. Uh, still, we, we, you see more or less, I'm showing you pictures, one from 1870s, the other from 1900. And more or less it's the same picture, different people of course, but the photographer chose exactly the same vantage point to take the image from. And in the second one, the caption is written on the back, so I did not include it. It simply says throngs of pilgrimage, pilgrims, sorry, and others. Which is, you know, pilgrims go to holy sites on pilgrimage. It could be a river as in India. It could be an empty mountain somewhere. It's a holy location. But they are pilgrims. They are not part of an organic society. So even when you have people here, they're reduced basically to an occasional pilgrim. And then of course he adds the others. This is an uh, American photographer, Almandorf is his name, uh, who actually ironically published a book of photographs in 1901 entitled Camera Crusade Through Palestine. Again, the same kind of mentality. Uh, we also see another example of uh, uh, reenactment of parables by Jesus. Here we have a stereoscope and the title uh, or the caption, sorry, says on the road to Jericho, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And uh, if you know the parable of the Good Samaritan, it's a story that Jesus told about a Jew who was injured or fell or was sick and other Jews passed by and did not pay attention to him, and he was helped by the Samaritan. And Samaritans are the enemies of the Jews at the time in that uh, 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 discourse. And therefore, even an imaginary a story told by Jesus becomes, uh, is represented. But it is represented, ironically, with local elements that don't even respect or are not informed by the local traditions. As the guy who's going away, which in the parable is a Jew, is actually dressed like an Armenian monk, Armenian priest. It's the Armenian priests who wear this kind of hat. The guy on the floor, not very clear, but the guy who's helping him is not how the Samaritans in Palestine dressed at the time and to this day. They have a particular attire. But here we have a regular Palestinian peasant uh, looking person. I don't know if he's acting or not. Uh, so even the authenticity of the image, there was no need to bother. The Europeans want to see an image, you, you create an image 
uh, we find a lot of other images here uh, called, you see a man and a woman and a child on a donkey, and the caption is always on the road to Egypt, bringing to mind also the flea of Virgin Mary and Joseph with uh, little Jesus, young Jesus to Egypt. Uh, we don't know who they are again, uh, the other thing, so many common images in the usually described as homes in Bethlehem where you see uh, a father, mother with a child, a uh, camel or a number of others also brings to mind the birth of Jesus. Not what the place is. Maybe these are the authentic people. I don't know. Maybe they're acting. It doesn't matter at this point. We see also lots of images, very common in 19th century, up to the probably 1930s, of lepers, people with leprosy in Palestine. And those, uh, Jesus, according to the Bible, healed the lepers. So, uh, I, I don't see, I grew up in Jerusalem, okay, not 19th century, but you know, I'm, when I walk down the street, maybe in, in 15 years, maybe I saw one leper, I don't know if I did. To find a group of lepers in a big city, this is, uh, you know, roughly around the beginning of the 20th century, the city numbered about 60,000 people. To find the five or ten or six lepers in Jerusalem and every photographer will take an image of them and will have a caption on the back with the verse of the Bible about Jesus healing the lepers. There are other images that became more popular. These are studio portraits of people's types. Women of Bethlehem, in reference to Jesus being born to the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem. Or an Arab from Bethany, as we see over here. An Arab from Bethany, uh, using the biblical name of the village of al which in the Bible was called Bethany or Beit Ania, historically. Uh, of course, again, we don't know who this guy is or who this woman is. We don't, uh, they don't really bother in, in, in that sense. Ironically, uh, for, uh, John Cramp, for example, a photographer who uh, went to Palestine in 1861, had this to say. He said, the women of Bethlehem are generally fair and always beautiful. Every traveler remarks that. Sincerely did I regret the arrangement that denied me the pleasure of bringing home witness to the correctness of my judgment. But I was not expected to spend my time on such subjects. Though I now think it's a pity that I was so scrupulous in the discharge of my duty. So it's a duty to document certain things, even, uh, uh, you know, documenting a woman, a beautiful woman, or a person is not, any, any person is not part of his mission uh, or of his assignment in Palestine. There are other ironic situations which I'd like to talk about, which is the photographs of religious leaders. And here we have the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem over here in the early 20th century. In the 1860s, we have the Patriarch, uh, the uh, Maronite Patriarch of Jerusalem. I checked these two images. The religious, the uh, Orthodox Patriarch is an authentic character and his name is known, Demianos. Uh, so this is a real person. The, Maronite Patriarch, and I don't know, uh, Europeans probably are familiar with the Maronites. It's a sect in Mount Lebanon in general that is Catholic, uh, familiar especially to the French, and this is a French photographer in this case. There are no Maronites in Palestine, and there is no office called the Patriarch of Jer the Maronite Patriarch of Jerusalem. Either this guy was the Patriarch of Beirut or Mount Lebanon, and it probably was a bit more sexy to call him the Patriarch of Jerusalem, or it's just, you know, uh, someone posing in order to sell because people don't want to see Greek Orthodox or Muslim or Jewish rabbi or whatever it is. It will sell well to uh, have someone pose in that position. So the very authenticity of the characters is always in question. 
it becomes even more ironic. Here are two pictures taken by the same photographer, Adrian Bonfils in, around, in the 1870s, and his French photographer who filmed uh, greatly in the Middle East, of the same person in the same studio. In fact, in his catalog, uh, it's not clear here, but they are, uh, uh, you know, numbered, I think, 632, and the next one is 634 or something like this. So they're next to each other. It's the same day, the same uh, uh, glass negative at the time, of this same person in the same dress. In the first picture here, he is called the Grand Rabbi of Jerusalem. This is the head of the Jewish community. The Grand Rabbi of Jerusalem is, is, a, is a very significant post like the Patriarch of Jerusalem or the Mufti of Jerusalem or whatever it is. In the Ottoman tradition, there was something called the Millat system. Each religious group were, had an autonomy in, according to the law in the Ottoman system and their legal uh, structure was headed by either the Patriarch or the Rabbi or by Mufti or by any, anyone else. Uh, and you know, like, like really heads, and they were assigned governmental powers. They had uh, guards, Ottoman guards with them, or, or people hired by the Ottomans. So a Grand Rabbi is something not only religiously very important, but has the high status. However, the same person appears in the next picture as a, as a cotton carder in Jerusalem, as someone who takes your pillow, takes the cotton out, and what is it, Buffett or something like this in order to... Now, maybe, you know, you would think maybe people need money, they can have a, a, a side job. But considering the Ottoman system and the religious significance of this position, it is impossible to imagine that the Grand Rabbi has a job on the side, uh, buffing your, your pillows or whatever it is, or your mattresses. So clearly, this is, looks like a Jewish man, looks like an, an, an Eastern, or what you called at the time, Sephardic Jewish man. This is, at least he's dressed like that, but he has the beard and the hair for it. Uh, but whether he's the Grand Rabbi or not, of course, we don't have names, or whether he's just an actor who was hired, a person who was hired because there is demand for such images. Uh, I add this here because I found this online looking at old pictures of Palestine, and this is a early 20th century image, and it is called Judge Shamgar. Who knows what who Judge Shamgar, but must be some uh, important uh, biblical uh, or, uh, or Old Testament uh, person. But of course, we know from the picture, this is a typical dress of Palestinian peasants at the time, and there is no way a judge is going to be, uh, you know, pushing the car or, uh, or tilling the soil after his cow or donkey. Uh, the reason I showed this here because this is used to this day by evangelical Christians in the, in the United States, in their Bibles. So this is, uh, I guess I downloaded it 2013, but it's still online. So this kind of imagery is still dominant somehow in the imagination of the, uh, of the, <coughs> Shall we call the Bostellers and just make it easier? Another trope is that European photographers, generally speaking, went to the, what they called the Orient, which is anywhere from Morocco to India. And uh, generally speaking, were interested in exotic imaging. We see that clearly in the paintings of great European, particularly French painters, of the slave market, uh, nude women, etc., etc. The uh, archive of French photography in the 19th century of Morocco and Algeria is full of nude women. Uh, but Palestine doesn't have that. Why? One wonders. Why do we find images like this of people, in, uh, of women in Lebanon or in Syria? 
uh, or in Egypt or Morocco, but not in Palestine. Is it because it's the land of the Bible, it's holy, we cannot, it's sacrilegious to do this thing? However, there were exceptions, and this is the only exception I saw. Not that it's very erotic, but a woman with an exposed breast over here, 1870s, again, Bonfils, the photographer, and she is described as a Bedouin from Jericho in Jerusalem. So she cannot even be from Jerusalem. She has to be a Bedouin from Jericho in Jerusalem. But it is very similar to the next one taken by another French photographer. They're both studio images. The same kind of thing with the pose, whatever she's carrying on her head, exposed breast, etc. Uh, here it's described as a Bedouin from Beirut. Those of you who are familiar with Beirut. I've never heard in the written history records of Beirut that it was a site where Bedouins camped. It's a city, a historic city, a port city. Uh, Bedouins are known to be in other parts of Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, Arabia in general, but not in Lebanon. So whether this is a Bedouin from Beirut, it doesn't matter. It seems like, you know, the, the tales of the thousand and one nights, the imagery of the exotic Orient made their way somehow. Uh, I add this picture because these are three images of uh, the the one up is 1870s, this is 1890s, different photographers, and this is uh, tw uh, 1920s. And they are all called the first view of Jerusalem. This is the caption. Now, what is a first view of any place? I mean, maybe if you had an airport and you landed somewhere, this will be your first view. But there was no airport. And tourists or pilgrims or travelers came from Europe via the port of Jaffa to the west of Jerusalem. And they came all the way to Jerusalem from the direction of the west. These are images taken from the south. There is nothing significant about having this being the first view of Jerusalem. This is a view of Jerusalem. Now, I can understand the first photographer who did that, probably was his first view, maybe he came from the direction of Bethlehem, and that's what he first saw. But the uh, recurrence of the same image with the same captions by a number of photographers, as if in order to prove that you took an image of Jerusalem, you had to take the same one, use the same caption that was used before. Not only that, Clearly, all photographers had to wait until a caravan of camels or donkeys came exactly at that curve in order to be authentic somehow. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, from, uh, the first one is from a, an American writer from, uh, or, or travel log writer from Ohio, who visited Palestine twice, and will give us some ideas. His name is Miller, Dennis Miller, and he uh, describes that from Jaffa, to, uh, describes his second uh, uh, visit to Palestine after maybe 20 years or something. He says, from Jaffa to Jerusalem by railway, robs this most interesting journey of much of its old time sentiment and brings it down to commonplace of everyday life. The first feeling that comes to us as we stand on the platform at the depot in Jaffa and hear the bell ring and the voice of the conductor shouting all aboard for Jerusalem is that great sacrilegious has been committed in, every, in the very fact of building a railroad in the Holy Land. Why do I bring this here? Because it relates to the photographs. These photographers they saw a Palestine that existed 2,000 years before their time and photographed that Palestine, depicted everything that way. The main theme is fixity. Fixity of the land. It's not supposed to develop. And if it does, then that is, there is a major problem over there. Major problem that it's violation of the Holy Scripture or what have you. Uh, Elmendorf, Dwight Elmendorf, another American, writes places mentioned, he, he went to Palestine on his camera crusade, 
to uh, document places mentioned in the Bible, to study ancient customs which still remain, again, fixity. Uh, and if possible, to understand the significance of the many sentences in the scripture which were very obscure to me and those who tried to teach me. So the bottom line here is photography biblified Palestine. Palestine truly is the land of mentioned in the Bible, mentioned in the three, uh, the holy books of the three religions. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. But there is a lot more to an inhabited, socially inhabited place. But to reduce it only to an image that is fixed in time, that is connected to the Bible, is already visually colonizing Palestine and replacing its reality with an imagined reality. And having said this, I want to jump to this image. This is a Zionist image taken by a Zionist uh, Jewish immigrant from Russia. Ben Dov is his name. Uh, it's dated 1909. And Zionism is the movement that succeeded later on in colonizing Palestine in a settler for colonial form. And Zionism, uh, uh, as of, uh, of 1904, created a slogan, political slogan in, on its posters that said a land without a people for a people without a land. And photography that predated that slogan, as we've seen, already showed Palestine as a land without a people. But here, Ben Dov takes an image in 1909 on the shore of the Mediterranean. And this is an image, you see it in many publications by the Israeli state and their websites, etc., etc. This is the founding of the colony of Tel Aviv, which becomes later on the largest city in Palestine, Israel. And here are the immigrants were doing the, what do you call it, like some sort of lottery to divide the lots. It fits well with the image of Palestine as an empty place. And it fits well also with the other Zionist slogan of Palestine, uh, of the Zionists came and made the desert bloom. Here we have a desert, no one, and then, you know, and then you have uh, in no time a flourishing Mediterranean city in this particular place. However, if we think of where was this photograph taken from, this photograph is on the beach and it is taken with the photographer's back to the sea with a particular angle where what you see in front of you is a desert. But Tel Aviv was built next to the city of Jaffa and today Jaffa is a neighborhood in Tel Aviv, was swallowed by it. Had the photographer moved little bit to the side, this is what he will be in the background, will be a city that is more than 4,000 years old, one of the most vibrant cities in Palestine with the largest population, uh, important in the Mediterranean trade, connects Palestine with Europe, with Turkey, with Egypt, Alexandria, there was a direct line all the time. So the choice of what is in the frame and what remains outside of frame is a very much a conscious choice. Still, uh, this is not so great because I took it from a film. The same Bindov photographer took a, one of the earliest movies of Palestine, not the first, but one of, and it was called The Jews of Palestine. And this is in the same occasion. If you look at the picture, of, I froze the frame so it's not great, but if you look at the picture of the Jewish immigrants gathered over here, and in the distance, you see some Arabs, some locals. So they penetrated the picture. They're not intended to be the picture. They were curious to see what's happening. Who knows what, what brought them into that frame. But in the formal photographs, of course, the camera moves very quickly. You miss them in, in the film. But in the photograph itself, they were very careful not to include them. So the question must always be asked, what is in, not only what is 
within the frame, but what is outside of the frame? Why was it left out? And to end this part of my talk, uh, am I doing okay? Yeah, okay, maybe we'll have discussion about the other themes. This is a photograph of the Damascus Gate in the uh, walled city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> Uh, because photography, uh, early photography was bulky and hard, photographers carried glass negatives, had to pitch a tent, mix their chemicals, spread it on the glass negative, put it in the camera, go outside, take the image, return to the tent, the dark tent, print the image, then wash the glass negative and put the chemical again and take, there was no uh, negatives as we knew them. The celluloid film was not invented yet. It seems that our photographer did not clean his plate well. So in the shadows, you see images of what seem to be a donkey, a cow, and a person. It's not very clear. In front of an empty, Damascus gate, it was the most important gate in the city. Markets are there but he managed to capture it at a time when it's empty. But still, within the frame, we see the traces of Palestinian presence, despite the fact that it is intended to be an empty land in some sense. My conclusion is, before there were projects to colonize Palestine, before there was a successful first British project and later on the Zionist project that led to the State of Israel, before there were slogans by Zionists that Palestine is a land without a people, for a people without a land, the visual representation of Palestine through photography already created that image of a land that is empty and waiting to be redeemed and colonized by the Europeans. And that's what I call the colonizing by ima imagination that is a necessary element to eventually lead to actual colonization. Not that all these photographers were preparing, it's not a conspiracy, but it's, it's, a, it's a cultural blindness that, were, that reflected more the European mentality, imagination, and certainly ideology, which started to preach, la preach later on the necessity of colonizing Palestine. Thank you. Thank you.